Yes, thumbs up. Yes, good, perfect. All right, uh, so my name's uh, Robert Hansen. Uh, this is Tom Strassner. We're talking about exploiting Google gadgets. Um, it's nice that you guys could come and join us. I thought the room was gonna be about a third the size. Um, so um, welcome to everybody. Um, you might have seen some stuff in the news um, over the last couple days, uh, front page of MSNBC, Associated Press. Um, uh, it's all over the place. So, um, so we modified the speech a little bit uh, from uh, Black Hat just because we got more information uh, over the last couple days. Uh, and we also had to shorten a little bit uh, just to fit it in the hour time slot. Uh, so we're gonna be kind of racing through a couple points. But you'll get the, the good stuff. So of course you know Robert, he really needs no introduction. Um, then my name is Tom Strasner, I'm a senior security analyst for uh, Sensic Inc. We're an application security company, uh, specialize in producing an application security scanner and do software as a service. So uh, I'm their chief analyst and uh, this is Robert. I'm Robert Hansen for the five people in the audience who've not met me. Um, please come up afterwards, I'd like to talk to you. Uh, but I, I run a small uh, consulting company, it's five people. Um, we have more billion dollar companies than we have employees. Um, and uh, I run a small um, website called hackers.org and slackers.org. Ever heard of it? Anybody? Okay. Uh, yay, there's one person back there. So, um, yeah, who's our snake? That's me. Uh, so I, I just wanted to start off by saying uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, this is the first time I've ever talked at uh, DEF CON. I've talked to Black Hat three times, but uh, this is the first time here. Um, so I'm actually really honored to be here. Um, I wanted to start this whole thing off by spending a, a couple minutes, and I apologize, but I kind of want to do this because I think it's important, talk about the history of how this all came to be. Um, there's been a lot of miscommunication, I, I think mostly on my part, um, and there's been a lot of reasons for that, a lot of people that I had to protect and a lot of stuff going on. I didn't want to do things too quick, too fast. Uh, so I want to talk about what happened, um, and hopefully that'll explain some of this stuff. Um, only a few people know the story. Uh, myself, um, a couple people at Google know par knew parts of it as they, you know, kind of floated in and out of the company. Um, I'm the only kind of consistent factor in all of this stuff. Um, so just sit back, and I'll explain. Uh, so before we start, I think we've all heard these types of sentiments before, different companies. Uh, this is Google's version of this. Um, you know, if you find a vulnerability, we ask that you share with us and we'll let you know and we'll, well, we'll fix it in a timely manner or whatever, all that, the kind of normal, uh, normal jargon you get from big companies. Uh, so we'll get back to this. This is the director at uh, Google. So this all started about four years ago, um, 2004. Um, I found, uh, well, not me personally, but the people I was working with um, found a bunch of uh, redirections were being used uh, by Fishers um, through Visa, DoubleClick, eBay, and Google uh, to try to anonymize and or you know, confuse users as they were clicking through things to land on a uh, page that they didn't assume they were going to be landing on. Um, so we told everybody about the problem, for those of them who weren't aware, and of course no one was aware. Um, so we told everybody that it was happening, um, and everyone perked up immediately and said, oh yeah, that's bad. Um, so they went off to go do their fixes, um, or not. So in this case, uh, Visa closed their hole down in a, just a matter of hours. It was amazingly fast, incredibly fast. I've never seen anything like it. And, v and usually redirects are kind of complicated to close, because you end up breaking functionality. Um, double click fixed theirs within days, but they only sort of fixed it. Uh, they fixed it with a blacklist. They said they have a permanent fix for it, but they didn't want to turn it on because they didn't want to incur the usability hit if they didn't have to. They thought it was a one time deal, and for them it was. So they did a good job. Um, they have the ability to turn it off anytime they feel like it. eBay fixed it within a couple of weeks, and there's a bunch of reasons why it took that long. Like I said, a lot of the functionality that they had to kind of deal with, and they broke stuff, and so they had to fix that other stuff. Um, and Google still hasn't fixed all the vulnerabilities and it's been four years, so. So, um, you know, word got out fast. This wasn't just something that like a couple of companies knew about. Like it's out there, like this is happening. It's in people's inboxes. I'm not making this stuff up. So 2004 uh, was when it really started. Uh, about 2006 it started being used for spam as well. Um, but um, it's out there. I mean, if you search for this stuff, you're gonna find it. So there's a couple of failures that kind of came to be throughout this whole process uh, that I'd kind of like to point out. You know, everybody's got vulnerabilities. I'm not the guy to say, oh, that guy's you know, horrible. He's got terrible security because he's got one tiny little redirection hole. Um, but you know, I I'm, I'm pretty sensitive to people's problems, but I also try to protect consumers whenever possible. So we informed Google um, that they, they were actually being exploited and you know, 
they said, okay, we're going to fix this, but we're going to do it with a blacklist. And, you know, I think we all know how to get around a blacklist. You just change a character and you're past the blacklist. So that didn't exactly work, and the bad guys figured it out as fast as I just told you. Um, so, um, so um, we felt like, you know, that this kind of bad, you know, we should be talking with them. So we, we had a bit of a dialogue, and they just wouldn't budge. Um, and actually, it took a really long time to even get them to implement the blacklist. Um, I don't have a time frame for you, but it was months. Um, so there was a, there's a bunch of reasons why you'd want to fix it, um, or sorry, to, why not to fix it, rather. Um, it's expensive. You, know, you have to hire, you know, or if you don't have, already have the engineers on staff, uh, you have to QA it and you know, release it, and you break stuff, and you've got to go QA and release that stuff, and it takes time and that kind of stuff. Um, it's useful for tracking users, um, and that's pr the primary reason why most of that stuff was there in the first place. Uh, it was actually designed so they could track people as they're navigating through the site and click on links so that they can do navigation changes or you know, tune their rules or whatever. So, and you know, lastly, it would break stuff like feeling lucky, uh, which is a huge portion of why people like Google so much. You can click that button and you're on to the next page and it's great. You don't have to deal with them, you know, the, the whole search results thing. I don't know, does anyone actually use that by the way? Raise your hand, please. Like one, two. So okay, Google, you can fix that one. So why to fix it? Um, you know, altruism, right? It's the right thing to do. Google's not evil, right? We're trying to fix a consumer level problem. Um, you know, it's you know, it's being used. It's not a theoretical attack. It's actively being used by bad guys. We've got tons and tons of examples of it. Um, and ultimately, it stops contributing to the problem. So I waited two years. You know, I. I sat on it, I talked with them, I didn't do anything for two years, and then I went full disclosure on their ass. So I don't, I don't hate Google, right? But I like consumers a lot more, it turns out. Um, so first thing I did was release four redirection vulnerabilities on full disclosure, I think it was. Uh, or bug tracks, I can't remember which one now. But um, and I didn't get any reaction. No one even no one even commented on it or anything. So I was kind of like, well, that didn't work. Um, so then I disclosed an XSS vulnerability, and then suddenly it exploded. Everybody was all interested. Everyone wanted to talk about it, and it's like it's the same damn thing. I can redirect either way, you know. Sure, there's other stuff, and I can grab cookies, but the, the bad guys are really very interested in this redirection thing too. So. Um, I was trying to use that as a point to leverage the bigger picture, which is that we need to close down this redirection thing that's just still there. It's been there for years. We're going to fix that. So um, Google actually agreed with me. This isn't something like they're like, no, no, you know, this isn't something we want to fix. Uh, Matt Cutts is uh, their head search guru. Um, he, he's uh, kind of the unofficial spokesman for search. And there's three different examples of him on the net talking about why this is bad and how it's being used for phishing attacks. So Google knows. They agree. This is... You know, not me just sitting up here telling you it's a bad thing. They agree with me. So, so why do I personally care about it? So first of all, let me explain how phishing technology works for those of you who don't like deal with this every day. Um, first, you have like known good sites. So like the website, you know, Annie Bay, uh, Citibank, those are the whitelist. You don't want to mark those as phishing sites. Even though they look an awful lot like a phishing site, it turns out they're the real site. Um, the False positives, you know, um, good example is Google Cache, for instance. You don't want to block Google Cache, so you have to put that on the white list. Um, webmail, it looks like an awful like a phishing site. It's got a form on it. It might even say, you know, username and password, even though there's no username and password field necessarily. Uh, so all that you got to mark all that stuff as white list because you don't want to deal with it. Your CSRs don't want to get overloaded. It's a pain in the butt. So second is blacklists. You want to, you know, you have a known set of bad things people are sending to you or you detect it or whatever, and you want to mark it as bad, and you throw it in your anti-phishing stuff, and then everybody's safe a couple hours later when it propagates or 10 minutes or whatever it is, depending on the technology. Um, and lastly is heuristics. Um, and heuristics really aren't very good, it turns out. Um, I've read tons of papers, and every paper I've read just... It blows up in real life when you actually look at the vast weirdness of the internet. Um, so, uh, and you also have DNS sometimes, but that's you know stuff like Open DNS, and it doesn't work at all because Fishers have learned to use IP addresses, so that doesn't matter. Um, so, Google is not exactly the most um, forgiving company when you mark them as a phishing site um, and you block a million people from going to their website. Um, and, well, we did that because it turns out they were a phishing site. Um, and, you know, we felt bad about it, uh, but really at the end of the day, you have two options, right? You either aren't a phishing site or we mark you as a phishing site. So it's really, it's up to them to stop being a phishing site. So um, 
So um, I found this Google Gadget thing, uh, just kind of randomly looking at it one day. Um, and by the way, I never, never go to Google. So within five seconds, I found this thing too. Um, so it happens that JavaScript can redirect as well. It doesn't just have to steal cookies or all this other stuff. It also can redirect. Um, it's pretty good at it, as a matter of fact. Um, and it turns out that most people have JavaScript turned on, especially when they're on Google, because B Google breaks a lot of stuff if you don't have JavaScript turned on. So I'm, I'm nice, though, this time. I'm, I'm actually trying to be nicer to Google. You know, I kind of fluctuate. Sometimes I'm like, come on, Google. And then other times I'm like, hey, Google, you know. Um, so this time I actually release it to him. I send it to him, and I'm like, all right, you know, here it is. I'm being a nice guy, gentleman. Go fix it. You know, they've been pretty good about re um, XSS in the past. So um, their response is, on further review, it turns out that this is not a bug, but instead the expected behavior of this domain. All right. Since these modules reside on the gmodules.com domain instead of the Google domain, cross protection stops them from being used to steal Google specific cookies. So they gave me the definition of XSS. Well, it sort of turns out that I wrote the book on XSS. <laughs> so my response was a one word wow. Because what are you going to say to that, right? So, um, so shame on you, Google, right? <laughs> So Google already agreed that this was bad, right? We, they agreed. They're, we're on the same page. Google's still an evil litigious company. It's more net, maybe now so than ever. There's a lot of uh, reasons that they're more you know, careful about how they, uh, they protect their brand. Uh, Google doesn't have the first clue about what JavaScript could be used for, apparently. Um, and they lied about the danger of the vulnerability that they had already agreed to fix, in this case, the redirection vulnerability. I'm not going to worry about that guy. Um, so, and bad guys are still using it. So there's other stupidity um, that just kind of rolls into all this stuff. Um, this is another guy who found the exact same type of vulnerability, but it was in Blogspot. Um, and he said, uh, this is an email that he's relaying to me, uh, the issue you describe is not actually a vulnerability and is not cross-site scripting. In this case, you are simply including a loud script in your blog. This does not constitute a security breach. You heard me. If you include malicious JavaScript, that's not a security breach. You heard it from Google. So it turns out that Google is marked as the most top infected uh, IP range by Stop Adware by their own metrics. This is not somebody else's metrics. That's theirs. Um, uh, th th they were quick to remind me of that. I don't know why that helps, but there you go. Um, th this is uh, something that was posted on my blog. So you know, normally when people are posting on their, my blog, they're talking to me or to other people. Um, and in this case, he's talking in third, uh, third person. So Google, I, you know, their internal department is trying to defame me on my own website from their own IP space. So it turns out I'm pretty good at looking at my logs. Um, so meanwhile, more holes are opening. Things keep opening up. And you know, we're not getting ahead of the problem. We're actually opening up more vulnerabilities. And um, so I, I, I kind of want to get ahead of this problem because it turns out that you know, this is now, I, my mom serves the internet. I kind of care, right? I've got a vested interest. Um, so ultimately, I just want to stop fighting and let's all just get along and fix these things because, you know, I, I don't really like playing this game. I'm getting old, you know, 30, balding a little bit. Um, so this is uh, some other press-worthy stuff. Um, regarding secu uh, the security flaw disclosure, actually, this is about a Google desktop thing that I found unrelated to this particular topic, but just... Um, some uh, context. Uh, regarding the security flaw disclosure, Mr. Merrill, who uh, was their CIO, I think he just recently left a couple months ago or something, uh, says that Google hasn't provided much because consumers, its primary users today, often aren't tech savvy enough to understand security bulletins and find them distracting and confusing. They're very distracting. I, all this security stuff. Um, and all of you, you're too stupid to understand all the security stuff. Um, so because Google fixes, um, the, because of stuff they make in the servers are deemed invisible, they shouldn't have to tell you guys. So, um, and another thing, um, phishing problem, um, I, we were talking about something else, but news.com basically said, uh, in the two months since our snake first made his concerns public, no one from Google has publicly disputed anything he's said. Um, so it turns out yesterday, or two days ago, Google did dispute something I said, finally. So it's been four years, and they finally said, we don't agree with you. Um, and the one thing they said they don't agree with, not, not any of the actual security stuff, they, that, they, that they do agree with me on, I guess. Uh, but the thing they, and, and by the way, it's funny, they didn't come up to me and tell me that. They told the Associated Press. So 
they're Iran, and I'm the United States, and the Associated Press is Syria. So we're doing this three trifecta thing now. Where I can't talk directly to them. I've got to go through Associated Press or you guys. Um, so here we are. Um, and the thing they, they didn't like about what I said is that they said, you know, in the very few cases that they found malicious software on G modules, Im implying that it has happened, um, they were able to quickly take it down. Um, so, I, Tom, I don't know, did you ever have your G modules taken offline? No. I still, no. I haven't had mine taken offline. I took my own offline because um, there's a long story, but I have Jeremiah's password in one of them, so. So um, we're just kind of exacerbating some of the other problems. Um, and you know, we have to kind of go, like I said, pretty quick through this. But uh, um, Google is and will be and always you know, has been vulnerable. Um, they haven't been open about with consumers. They haven't fixed them in a timely manner. It's been four years. Um, and remember, if you share it with us, we will fix it. So we shared uh, a couple different vulnerabilities on Tuesday, which you'll also see. And I still haven't been told the timeline. So we know this is not a true statement. Um, it, it certainly hasn't happened for any of the redirection stuff. They have fixed some of them, but they haven't told me when. They haven't, you know, interacted with me on that level. Um, and ultimately, this all comes down to the fact that they just want to track you guys. So, what's up, DefCon? <laughs> I, I really don't see enough beer in anyone's hands. I don't know what's happening. This is terrible. Oh, good, 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 good. So this slide is really the, it really summarizes the, the essence of our talk. And, and, and it boils down to if, if today most malware is specifically engineered for Windows, uh, in the future, malware will be specifically engineered for the web. And I don't think there could be a, a more true statement. And this is a PDP quoting uh, uh, someone from his blog. Um, and so our speech is really forward-looking in this regard. And, and while Robert's introduction was essential to give you the background and the motivation, uh, there's actually a larger issue that we'd like to draw your attention to. But before we go and talk about that, um, I just want to be clear about what's at stake. And so there is the gadget XML construction that you actually create when you write your own gadget and this gets hosted. So in the C data section of the gadget, you can instantiate arbitrary JavaScript and HTML. If you browse to this URL directly, uh, it'll execute. Uh, there, this is one dimension of the problem. It's also a dimension which leads to phishing attacks and content spoofing. But there's an entirely other dimension. It's, it's what we're calling G malware because we think that sounds like a, a Google trusted type of malware. Um, and the idea is it's just a bad gadget. Now, is, the, is this a problem today? Is it rampant? No. Uh, all of the bad gadgets that we'll show you, we created in the lab. Uh, that being said, the potential is there, and it really points to a wider problem. Um, I'm going to skip a few slides just so that we can get to the movies, because they rock. Um, but the broader issue at stake really has nothing to do with Google at all. But it's, uh, it's the business end of the crack pipe of Web 2.0, right? And, and it is that everyone should be able to create their custom content and share this and be interactive and form communities. And you have this situation where you are empowering users in the form of gadgets or widgets or whatever, and whatever you're talking about, Facebook or Google or whatever, you know, or anything, as long as there's code written by untrusted third parties or that anyone can contribute to, once the profit motive is there, then the malware incentive will exist. So, no, there's not a lot of gadget-based malware today, uh, but the potential exists, and it's, it's actually a much broader systemic problem. Uh, so what about Google gadgets? Well, they're simple to build. You can run them on multiple sites. Uh, we'll talk about those in just the next slide. Uh, and, and in Google's own words, they have the potential to reach millions of users. So, uh, you know, high volume. Uh, I think it's important for you to understand that Google's vision for gadgets is actually pretty cool. Um, they speak about it often in ideological terms. So I'm going to just go through a number of points that really summarize the, what I think of as the spiritual heart of, of the idea of gadgets. And one is that they should spread via the social graph 
in a viral way. And this is really sort of a word of mouth, blogosphere way of spreading gadgets so that everyone ends up using them. Uh, they're decentralized, they're also cached, they're distributed so that if your gadget becomes a big hit overnight, you know, it, it isn't going to crash some server if everyone's using it because of the way the architecture is built. Uh, there's a fundamental idea of content-rich self-expression, and that's really where Google comes back and says, yeah, that's why the arbitrary JavaScript and HTML is needed. Um, over time, gadgets are supposed to dynamically change, and that means that as each of us in this room have our own favorite gadget, and we're using the same gadget, that as we use it, the gadgets can collaborate, and ultimately, the states of our individual gadgets will change to reflect, say, our own opinions, and Google calls this the social graph, right? And it's essentially an objective, what you might think of as an objective tap into the collective behaviors of the gadget as it's spread over a base of users. Uh, the idea is to expose the activity stream and to be able to create sort of visualizations of that and show, oh, look, this is the activity of the gadget. Uh, finally, you know, gadgets wouldn't be very interesting if they couldn't drive communication. The ultimate idea is that we should really use these and form communities around them, uh, whether it's... Um, smaller communities or larger communities, the idea is that people participate in a gadget system and that gadgets should solve real world problems and ultimately generate revenue. Google has seed money, uh, I think it's $100,000 for, for, for anyone that proposes to them a business plan where uh, there's serious revenue generating capabilities of a gadget. So the point being there is that once money actually starts flowing through and once the financial incentive for malware exists, then you're going to start seeing more of this type of thing pop up. Um, yeah, and I mean, we already have the, 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 the idea of phishing, and it's already being actively used, right? You, Robert, speak to that. But, but it, it, that's not a good business model. That won't get you the $100,000. Try something else. Please. Um, so where can you put your gadgets? Well, you can put them on iGoogle, your iGoogle homepage. You can put them on arbitrary websites. Uh, you can build them to interoperate with like Orcut using the open social API. Uh, or you can create them to interact with your desktop, uh, which foreshadows a lot of the problems that we're likely to see. So what are the high-level security concerns? When Robert and I set out to do this speech, we really just sort of scratched our head and said, what, what a priori, what are the problems we expect to find? Now, we made a long list, and we actually uh, created proof of concepts and discovered vulnerabilities that closely matched our initial expectations. The high-level concerns are that gadgets can be easily weaponized. You can turn them into payloads. And by a payload, I mean specifically that, a malicious gadget designed to deliver a particular type of malicious code to the user, whether it's Flash or JavaScript or whatnot. Um, they're, they're written by who, who the hell knows who, you know. Um, Third-party code can be contributed, and this is part of the Web 2.0 vision, right? But the, the end result is that there's, uh, you really have to stretch hard to find accountability within the gadget community, or who wrote it, and can I, can I have some level of assurance as a user that I'm getting what, I'm, what I think I'm getting when I use this gadget? Um, what we will show you is that within iGoogle, within, with on your, within your iGoogle homepage, gadgets can attack one another, and they can potentially attack the desktop. Uh, and of course, they can have the same vulnerabilities as most web apps. So I just would like to present to you a, a basic warning so that there are, Google does suggest that there's a potential risk there with gadgets. For instance, uh, most of our gadgets are created by third parties. If you have questions or concerns about the functionality or content, contact the author. Right? That doesn't really do you very much good if you have a malicious gadget that's tracking your behavior. You think the author is going to be sympathetic? No, of course not. Um, from a high-level perspective, I'm just going to breeze through these. There's issues in gadgets with JavaScript, HTML, and script injection. Uh, there's the potential for defacement of one gadget or manipulating its content through poisoning. And, and this is kind of a weird thing, but if you can imagine scenarios with cross-site request forgery where the gadgets are, themselves are, are measuring, say, some uh, rating or, or approval or some voting process, and that there would be ways to manipulate gadgets in order to skew that toward one party or the other that's in the voting queue. Um, 
you can spoof gateways very easily, uh, and it's not always clear whether your connection is secure when you're using them. But ultimately, and this is really speaks to the uh, uh, fresh brand of uh, gadget malware that Robert has created, because you can perform surveillance in a very invasive manner, um, and you can also create exposures. Finally, there's a whole range of uh, bad things. So hopefully, our, our videos will you know speak to that. Um, and at the underlying point is that. It's not that, ga that, that, that gadgets are bad and should never have been created, but that if you're someone with, a, with malicious intent, you can really do some very dangerous things. Um, I really loved this because uh, um, I was poking around um, creating some gadgets, and this was actually um, a testing container for gadgets. And if you'll look up here, it, this was Google's coders completely. It has the option to do evil. And Robert created the sort of uh, Shakespeare pearl version of the, uh, the humor there for you to appreciate. Um, but I just found that to be absolutely freaking hilarious. Um, so the advanced API digs down into the desktop, really mucks around there. And um, the important point to take home is that there is the potential for these little mini applications that exist on your iGoogle homepage to interact with your desktop, right? Now, uh, maybe you see the big warning there when you read and you say, well, maybe I don't want to install the performance o meter. But actually, it's not so clear cut in the wild because we can create some very malicious gadgets that you may not even know you've added. So thought experiment time, the people's gadget. The reason why I, I've chosen this topic is because there's no better example of, a, of, of an agency that has coercive intent than a government that attempts to suppress certain rhetoric or to monitor subcultures. And so there is, th this will just give you a framework in order to understand how one could use what you might think of as relatively innocuous functionality to create some very malicious gadgets. Um, this is pure shock value, but you know this guy's about to get run over by three very big gadgets. Are you feeling lucky? Yeah. Um, so what types of, if you think of just, what types of innocuous functionality could actually become dangerous if your intent was to spy or your intent was to be coercive? Well, even something as simple as monitoring the incoming feeds that you, you, you're pulling in from website for content, uh, counting word frequencies, and actually determining if the content is subversive, uh, you could actually have a gadget that is uploading your IP address in the search terms that you're using. He'll show you that. Um, you can have a gadget that actually looks in spiders' websites that you retrieve content from, and so that this gadget could actually determine to build a picture of, uh, uh, of the world around itself. Now, it shouldn't be lost that the gadgets of this nature can also spider and crawl your internal network. So while you're happily surfing away at iGoogle, this thing is plunking away at your internet. Um, I don't think there, there's uh, much more to say on that. Um, some of the serious problems boil down to cross-site request forgery. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide because I have a movie. Robert, do you want to yeah, speak to anything? Here? Yeah. Just very briefly, a couple of them. Um, so the one that you can see, it's sumsite.cn. Um, so you know, one thing about the Chinese firewall is if you send certain packets through, um, like the word like Falun, which is Falun Gong, which is sort of like Tai Chi, except way more dangerous, um, it's, uh, if you send that across the wire, the Chinese firewall will shunt you for like five minutes or something. So if my business happens to do a lot of business while going through a single NATed IP address, I can basically essentially DOS you from connecting to your you know, supply chain management or whatever in China. Um, and another one is like child pornography. Um, there was a couple cases of that where you know somebody was inadvertently downloaded or got some spyware or whatever. And you, know, you guys have all heard those cases. But um, one example is you know I don't necessarily have to even know where child pornography is. I just have to construct enough query strings, send you through whatever, and you end up on those pages. And it turns out I'm pretty good at guessing what child pornography contains. Um, so. SQL injection, remote file includes, all that stuff. I can force you to connect to any internal websites or external. I can force you to hack on my behalf, all kinds of nasty stuff. So, I mean, just cross the request forgery. I think you're all aware of it. We'll have an example, though. All right, so let's get, let, let's, let's get into the movies, and we'll show you. Um, the first example that I want to pull up and show you is, is an example of G-malware. Now, 
the, gener the general concept to take away is that you have a popular site that you suspect the user is going to have an account on. You create a gadget designed to take an action on that account through cross-site request forgery that the user isn't aware of. Now, in the demo I'm going to show you, it's really obvious. It's very, I, I made the windows, you know, expand to full screen and everything. But in real life, you don't have to see any of this. So actually, what I'll show you is owning singlesnet.com with a little gadget. It's actually the Hello Kitty gadget. Um, so here's our gadget. Click me. Hello. So here, here, is, um, here we are. We're player John Hancock 2000, and we're logging in. So... Um, you know, we, we've been, we're trying to get a good hookup here on SinglesNet, and I reported this vulnerability two years to them, two years ago. And uh, I'll tell you their response after you see the demo. But ultimately, you can see that here I am. This is my, uh, my email. And you'll notice you can change your password. New, but you don't have to input your old password. Okay? So you just put your new password in twice. And there's zero protection against cross-site request forgery. So you can actually create a form spring-loaded by JavaScript, mounted on a server, and then I just instantiate a little pop-up window in JavaScript, stick it off screen, and so the, it immediately launches a CRSF attack against this site. Having clicked the gadget, our password is no longer valid. Um, so now we're going to log in as the attacker, and uh, we can log in with the same username or with a different email address, and of course with our brand new hacked password. Uh, and so now you can notice that the attack, just the gadget itself, changed the contact email. Um, so this is one example of, of a piece of maliciously designed uh, gadget technology that could trick the user into performing an action that they don't want to take. And it's not limited to singles.net. It's just that uh, they are highly susceptible to it. Um, so... Other things that we, what I, what I said about my contribution to this part of the, uh, to our talk was to actually port some, what I think of as like hack, you know, hackware, JavaScript to gadgets, just to see how, how far I could go. So one of the things that uh, we ported, and, and in my blog, uh, badgadgets.net, I'll put up the, uh, the links to the XML if you actually want to play with these abominations. Um, but ultimately, we ported uh, PDP's Yahoo Site Explorer spider so that it queries uh, the Yahoo page data service and gives you a, a spidering of a website based on that. And you can call external PHP scripts. That's just sweet. Especially if you want to do like a shotgun attack against a user's browser and root them. Um, you can actually do that just fine with a little gadget. Uh, consequently, scanning for this sort of thing is kind of hard because since they allow you to just pull up arbitrary content, you not actually see the malicious code inside the gadget itself. Uh, we also, so this is a PHP spider. So in all its glory, this is the example of the PHP spider that we were talking about. So the gadget can literally spider your intranet while you're using it without your knowledge. Uh, or it can use Yahoo's Site Explorer. Uh, finally, uh, I ported a port scanner. Uh, once again, uh, PDP, uh, from his attack API, I just ported the port scanner from there uh, into a gadget. Worked, fa worked great. Now, this is, this is a picture of a phishing gadget. And actually, what you are seeing is a page rendered from the XML content of an existing gadget in the C, in the C data section the JavaScript and HTML is rendering, and it creates this fake page. And so we can use any type of uh, coding style that we want to make perfect, uh, basically, you know, simulacrums of any, you know, login portal. Um, consequently, uh, from some conversations I've had with, with Google, and I don't want to call the guy out by name because... Uh, you know, I actually have a pretty good working relationship with, uh, with this guy, so I'm not trying to, you know, smear mud. But there, there's a belief that this just really isn't that, a, a very significant problem. We really kind of beg to differ. Do you want to add something? So, so I know this slide doesn't really look like a whole lot, but I think this is probably the most important slide in the deck, even though it doesn't look like much. So imagine you're, you know, kind of tired. First, not, not take you out of the picture. Imagine your mom is pretty tired in the morning. She got her cup of joe, you know, woke up a little sleepy, watched I Love Lucy, you know. 
And uh, she wakes up, boots up her computer, you know, double clicks the Internet Explorer icon, takes her to her home page, and it's Google. And she's already authenticated because she never cleans out her cookies. Uh, and she turns her back, you know, goes, you know, takes a quick shower, something comes back, and she's presented with this page. She didn't click on a link. She didn't type anything in her email breast bar. She just clicked on a link. She didn't get an email. She didn't click anything. There's, there's no user interaction required whatsoever. You go to Google, and you're immediately presented with a phishing site. So when they're talking about, you know, you can't run JavaScript in context of Google.com, who cares? I don't have to. I can immediately redirect you to something that will basically every user is going to fall for this. There's only a very small handful of users probably in this audience, and that's about it, who are, won't fall for this immediately. And I think actually quite a few people in this audience probably would anyway. So, um, so um, the final thing is you know, exporting a tab to your buddy, and then the tab is sort of the, the container where all your gadgets live. What I, what I find really telling about this is you can export your gadget, but even Google says, otherwise, blah, blah, blah. Be careful. Your settings can include private data. So what this tells you directly is that your gadget isn't just some private little world that you, that you own exclusively and doesn't have any touch points to the Internet or the broader iGoogle framework. Your data resides within that gadget, and you can expose it. And I think that uh, on that note, I'm going to hand it back to Robert. So um, we built this uh, tiny little gadget. Uh, I apologize for having used multiple media players here. Does anyone know a really good media player that plays just everything so I don't have to deal with this anymore? KM? OK, got it. So, um, so there's two gadgets here. Uh, this one over here uh, on the left is uh, my little stockbroker application that I wrote. Uh, it just kind of you know keeps stocks, tells you how much stuff is worth. Um, uh, kind of a funny side note is Google is a thousand eight hundred dollars a share. They haven't learned how to split yet. Um, and on the other side is the bacon because swine is evil. Um, and so you'll notice they're on different domains. Now, I thought the different domain usage was actually a security function, um, but it turns out uh, that uh, I've talked with somebody at Google, and they said, indeed, it is not meant to be as a security function. It's actually meant for caching purposes. Um, so that's good because it wasn't much of a security function. Um, so here, the, um, I double clicked and uh, you know, or clicked on the link or whatever. I didn't have to click on a link. It could have just been automatic. I just did it to slow things down so you could see what was going on. Uh, and I popped up in a bunch of iframes, which are just all of those different domains, all the different subdomains, so 81 through 90. I just picked a range to speed things up. Um, and I found one on the other domain, which is 86.com, or 86.gmodules.com, rather, um, and which immediately does a redirection, or you know, immediately as I felt like. I think I gave it like 10 seconds or something. And uh, so what happened is I detected that there was a cookie in that other subdomain. So even though those two things are separate, um, they share common elements because you know things like cookies are work on the entire domain. So all I had to do was search for something that I thought might be there. In this case, I wrote a really terrible application that used cookies, um, and I was able to steal information out of it, including the cookie, which it could have login information. A lot of gadgets are very poorly written and have um, like unencrypted you know, nothing. You just send your data to some third party who then authenticates for you to some other third party. Like really scary stuff, actually. Um, so um, you can see here that I've uh, done an XML HTTP request, grabbed everything, um, all the content of that gadget, thrown it on the page just so you could see that, in fact, in fact it is there, um, and rendered the content as well. So you could you know, actually see that it in is indeed the same gadget. Um, keeping state was a little tricky, but it turned out it was not that hard to, to code. Um, so, so I can see stuff that, um, like stock tips or whatever, in this case, uh, it says to sell on a rumor of a G-module exploit. Oh, so this is uh, this is I, I just decided you know I've I've got a lot of really crazy logs, uh, so I decided to quickly parse through them and see if I got anything out of G modules, um, and indeed I did, um, and you know this doesn't necessarily have anything super sensitive in it, but this is only a couple of examples. How many people are really linking to me? Uh, but this easily could have contained all kinds of crazy stuff. Who knows what these people are putting in this URL structure? Um, so um, you know a lot of people are going to say you know like. Okay, you've demonstrated that the, the gadget framework 
potentially is dangerous, but who cares? How are you going to get it into somebody's iGoogle? That's the real trick, right? That's why we're all here. If you can't do that, this is a totally moot point. And I hate conferences. I hate speeches that just, you know, oh, theoretically, if I had your password, well, okay. Um, so there's a couple different ways to do it. First of all, they can add something that they think is good, you know, a breakout. It, it started off being good. It was a neat little ad, you know, gadget. And then suddenly I'm like, oh, oh, I've got so many people. And then I take them all over. Um, and so that, that's one way. Another way is that we can hack into somebody else's gadget framework, you know, someone else who's doing that hosting, and, you know, have them, you know, change their thing just slightly and into something bad. And it turns out websites are very easy to hack into. Um, we haven't yet found one that we can't. Uh, the other way, is, and this is a bad way, this, I, I don't actually think this is really hardly worth talking about, but um, if you have cross-site scripting on Google, and if you have it, why would you care about this? But if you had it, you could, if it was like a reflected XSS, you could use um, this as more of a kind of a persistent container for your cross-site scripting. So if you need like longevity, um, like a long-term attack, you know, it took a long time to do cycles or a lot of CPU or whatever, or you wanted to test many, many, many different things, well, this is one way to do it. Uh, barely worth talking about, though. And we can force them to add it remotely, um, evilly. So we created this, um, this little um, um, demo. And this is a little confusing to watch, and I apologize. Um, I didn't want to get on the DEF CON network and just worry about demos. I have bad demo karma. Um, so the IE instance is a bad guy. The Firefox instance is a good guy. Um, the, uh, the IE instance is um, actually, this is Jeremiah's account, long story. Um, and um, so I'm using it uh, to um, contain data and, and hold on to that account, and I'll be monitoring it. So um, you can see that's vulnerability master is the bad guy. Um, and I'm in his web history, um, you know, uh, whatever section of the website. So you can see nothing up my sleeves. There's nothing in there. I refreshed, and, and in fact, there is nothing in the web history. I cleaned it out just before I did this. So then I refresh, nothing there. There's no gadgets. Um, I'm in this uh, Teddy Leva. You know, Teddy is this nice woman who's, you know, doesn't want bad things to happen to her. And you notice she's on hackers.org, right? So what you see here is this little add it now thing that I made semi-transparent. I could have made it completely transparent, but I kind of wanted you guys to see what's going on. Um, well, that's two iframes. There's an iframe that's floating in space that's following the mouse cursor. We've all seen those things. You, things trail your mouse, and you're like, ah. You know, it's like a little clock or something. I hate that. Um, well, that's an iframe into another iframe, which is kind of positioned up into the corner. Um, so it just kind of frames exactly the specific x, y coordinates that I need to be right under the mouse cursor. Um, and you can do it for Internet Explorer or Firefox. It's just you have to deal with the kind of the cross and how, how wide it is or where it's located. So when I click on it, I'm not clicking on my domain, hackers.org. I'm clicking on Google. Uh, it's a couple of iframes away, but it's still that click is being all, going all the way through all those iframes to the real to, to Google. And what it's doing is it's adding a malicious gadget uh, that I've constructed. Uh, which normally is supposed to be off limits. I'm not supposed to be able to add, force people to add my own gadgets. So if you hit refresh, you can indeed see that there's a new gadget here, the bacon gadget. It's a different bacon gadget. Um, and this little broken link right here, um, or broken image rather, I made it visible so you could see what's going on. Um, and this is cross site request forgery, but uh, it's kind of same site request forgery. Um, but what, what it is, is um, it's a URL structure that allows you to log somebody into an account. Um, I don't know why you can have all, this, all that stuff on the get string. It's, already, it's not really a safe way to do things anyway. Um, but you can do it so you can force somebody to log in as yourself uh, if you really felt like it, which really doesn't seem like a practical attack for the most part, but it turns out it's fairly useful. Um, and a side note, it doesn't really matter if they fix this vulnerability and like stop that because um, I can actually, since I own this, I can do form submission and you know, as long unless they emit a nonce or something that I don't have control over, it, it's kind of pointless to fix that. Um, I didn't find that vulnerability. It's um, Stanford found it a couple of months ago, and it's still open. So, so you can see that uh, this image didn't render because it's not an image. Um, and now I'm going. Teddy's going to type in something that's very, very scary to her, and uh, she's got a little problem. She has herpes and they itch a lot. But she's feeling lucky today. So she clicks the feeling lucky button. And so she sees the, the content that she's interested. Now I'm back in the vulnerability master account. And I hit refresh. And indeed, here's her search string. Because she's not in her account anymore. She's in my account. 
So I can subversively watch her type queries in. So uh, that whole, you know, being able to, you know, keep that the separation of all those things is is totally dependent on whether I control your set, your browser session. And if if I've got a Google gadget there that allows me to do whatever I want, you know, it's just up to my imagination about how bad I want to be. So these are very simple examples. This, I mean, how long do you think this took me to build? You were there. Uh, two minutes. Two minutes. That's not like a long time. I didn't spend a lot of time on this demo. Maybe arranging it and making it look nice, yeah, but not building it. This is not a difficult hack. You guys can do this stuff. Um, and if you can do it, uh, that's pretty scary. We need to fix that, right? Um, so anyway, that... That was sort of the point. Um, so yes, this is a problem. It's just not being widely exploited yet. Um, <clears throat> so the real question is, is this expected behavior? Right? Are, are we okay with that as a community? Are we okay that a gadget has complete control over our desktop? You know, a lot of consumers are gonna say yes, as long as it's not bad. And that's the real trick, isn't it? We gotta figure out some way to have a container and stop all that stuff from happening. Uh, and we don't have that yet. Um, so the real point is it's bad. It may not be a true vulnerability in the sense that um, you know having a gadget isn't a vulnerability. Um, it's bad. So if I were a product manager in the Googleplex and I were to say, and some guy were to come up and me say, hey, by the way, you can fish users, uh, you can do internet port scanning, you can do redirection, all this stuff. You know, you know, I'm a product manager. I'm going to say, you know what? You know, maybe we should go rethink the security model a little bit. Uh, so I, whether it's whether it's actually a vulnerability or not, uh, it's bad. And that badness means that we should be talking about it as a community. Um, I got a lot of flack from this from Matsano. Um, and actually, I think we kind of came to a conclusion with that. Um, but it, I think it was mostly miscommunication on my part. I didn't tell him the history. There's a lot of stuff going on here. Um, but you know, I, I don't hold anyone for blame for not understanding this, at why it's a problem. But um, I think we should start talking about it as kind of the wider security context of the browser rather than, you know, this microcosm of one small widget. I mean, that's not, it's not a widget that I'm worried about. It's everything else. It's people's accounts. It's how the browser reacts to that widget if it's under my control. Um, so redirection ultimately abuses that, that trust relationship. Um, it all comes back to that original redirection problem that I was hounding them up for years ago. Uh, we still haven't found um, a way to stop that. And unfortunately, uh, JavaScript is still uh, still out there. I was uh, told that, um, that uh, Google did fix the uh, feeling lucky function, so it's no longer exploitable. Uh, so I typed in rsnake into feeling lucky, and I hit enter, and it took me to hackers.org. Does anyone think that I can't put malware on hackers.org? It's exploitable. I mean, it's not, maybe they can shut it off after the fact, but that's sort of that reactive security that we've proven time and time and time again that that just, it doesn't work unless you're okay with a couple people getting compromised. And I personally don't really like when people get compromised. I mean, my mom is one of those people and I want to keep her from getting compromised. So, and she tends to click on a lot of stupid stuff. I, by the way, somebody at another conference asked me, oh, what do you do what, when you tell your mom, like, blah, blah, blah. And like, I just say, mom, you're already compromised. And she's like, oh, no, am I? I'm like, yes. And she's like, she won't shop on anything anymore. So that's perfect. <laughs> so, so that's kind of the end of the speech. Um, I don't know if you guys had any questions. Yes. Yeah, uh, so there's actually an interesting, uh, he's asked, yeah, is there uh, JavaScript that actually det does detection um, and actually tries to react based on the fact that someone in particular is uh, looking at it? Um, and yeah, actually one of the most interesting things out there is there's a way in which you can uh, do browser sniffing to tell how high, wide and tall a screen is. Um, and some of the malware guys have decided that uh, that's actually a really good way to tell if someone's um, uh, a computer savvy. And in that case, they won't deliver the malware. So if you have a really wide screen, really tall, you're probably computer savvy, so they won't give you the malware. If you've got a little 640 by 480 screen, you're probably someone they can exploit because you've got an old computer and you, you probably don't know anything. Yes?
I, I, I don't know that there is a way to stop them from doing it. I mean, you're, you're sitting here listening to me tell you th that's not a good idea. Um, I don't have any control over Facebook or any MySpace or whoever else. All we can do is keep informing them of the problem. Yeah, there's a lot of background noise. So just come on up and ask us questions um, after the talk. Thank you, everybody. Hey, thanks.